Hello there, my name is John Meyer. In my last video, I talked about whether or not it's okay for us to be using pre-made loops and phrases from sites like Splice or from software like Arcade by Output. I discussed the cons, which are somewhat obvious, but maybe a few pros for why we should be doing it. So if the last video is part one, this is part two. I'm gonna to try to put into practice some of the things I discussed in the last video. I'm gonna use sounds from Arcade by Output, which is a subscription software service. I'm gonna see if I can't manipulate and mangle and tweak and reverse the sounds to make them almost unrecognizable from where they started. I'm going to divide the writing process into three steps. First thing I'm gonna do is browse the site for sounds that somewhat fit the vibe that I'm going for. I wanna write a track that sounds like New York City in the summertime at night with a very fast car, a very expensive car with beautiful people inside and Matthew McConaughey reading the voiceover. All right, all right, all right. With the modification. In this stage, I'll begin the customization process by at least trying to use some of the built-in modifiers that are in Arcade. You can do some reversing and chopping and just overall kind of weird manipulation that really helps make the sound your own. That is something that I would probably stay away from. It's melodic. It really stands out. And I might hear that in somebody else's production, and I don't want that. So that's when I would go to one of these modifiers. And if I hold down this, again, I'm not going to explain all these, but they trick up the sound in some really cool ways. If I hold that, record that while I record this note, this phrase, I get this. When I use phrase libraries like Arcade, I like to commit the MIDI tracks to audio as soon as possible because it's not a one MIDI note to one sound situation. These are phrases and they start and stop in weird spots. And so I like to commit them to audio because once I have the waveform, I have a better idea of what I'm working with. I can easily fly it around the timeline. I can chop it up. I can reverse it even more. I have a better idea of what to do with the sound once I can actually see it. The second phase is building up my timeline. I know I need the track to be over two minutes long. So instead of writing four bars or eight bars and then eight more bars, I try to lay things out in a non-linear fashion. So let's say that I have eight tracks and they're all playing at once at the beginning of the song and it sounds like a mess. I'll take half of them and I'll start shifting them down the timeline in different spots. Now, it's going to sound disjointed and I'm fine if it sounds disjointed where one section leads into another and it's not quite right. I'll go with that for a while and try to figure out ways as I get into the next phase of making those sound cohesive. But I found that even if those changes are somewhat drastic, that's gonna help me along the way because as I add other instruments that carry on throughout those sections, those changes that sound very drastic in the beginning end up sounding not so drastic once I have the more traditional elements going from section A to section B and so on. Part three of this process, I'm done with the arcade sounds. Now it's writing everything else. And disclaimer, I'm probably never gonna write a song with only one sample library or one piece of software, but it's YouTube, so why not? So now I'm following my instincts, trying to make this track as good as it can possibly be. And what's nice about this particular style is I've got a lot of reverses and a lot of weird textural sounds, and that really works in this style of music where you can be a little weird. It may not work as well in other styles of music when you feel like you can't manipulate the loops as much as you want because they might sound weird and too out of the box, but in this style, it actually is a benefit. The nice thing about writing this way, and I did this on purpose, there's not a ton of low frequency information, and there's not a ton of harmonic information, so I can do whatever I want. I've said this a dozen times on this channel that the blank screen of a DAW is terrifying and intimidating. So using sounds from Arcade helps get me to a place emotionally, a good starting place, so it's not so daunting. I'm a folk singer songwriter at heart, and if I'm honest, that's probably what I wanna be when I grow up. And one of my favorite singer songwriters of all time is a guy named David Wilcox, a huge influence on my music, an incredible songwriter, probably three of my top 10 favorite songs are from him. Over a decade ago, I attended a songwriting seminar that David put on. 
and he did this exercise called emotional scaffolding. It was really interesting and I was very surprised that he did it and that he showed us. He took a Bone of Air song, and he, I don't remember which one it was, and he played it in its entirety. And then he played it again and he started singing his own lyrics with the same melody that Bon Iver uses. Now, if you're a fan of Bon Iver, I have no idea what he's saying, so it works well with this particular artist. But he started singing his own lyrics that kind of had a emotion that was similar to the sound of the track. And then he turned the music off and he's got his guitar out and he kind of learned the basic chords. And then he started changing the chords up. And then he started changing the melody. And he deconstructed the song so much that when he played it at the end, there was very little connection to what we heard at the beginning. And so it's emotional scaffolding because the song and the way that it sound and felt and the way that it made him feel got him to a place where he could start thinking about words that fit that. And then he used technique and skill to break that down. And that's why I wanted to do this exercise with the sounds from Arcade in the first place, is that they take us to a place emotionally so that we're not starting with a blank screen. If a blank screen is zero and 10 is fully inspired, these loops get us to a three and then we can take it from there. I'm always looking for ways to take the creative process, which is still very mysterious to me, and break it down into small little chunks that I can then deal with one by one. By taking these loops and sounds and getting me started, it gets me to a place where I can trust, after years of experience, that eventually I'll get that spark. And that spark is what makes me wanna sit and write for hours. But I know that if I enjoy the process of creating, that the chances of me writing something original and inspiring, well, the odds go up. I'll go ahead and end it here, play the song for you in its entirety. If you like this, please subscribe and go check out part one. I'll talk to you soon.